How are you guys feeling? Good. Yeah, yeah. good. Yesterday we had a great dinner. I'm really curious to ask you both guys because you are Australian originally, Zach. Canadian. Is that, is that, you're Canadian. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. One of the other colonies. Yeah. Yeah. One of the <laughs> other colonies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you're and you're an American. Did you enjoy the ribs? I mean, you were. Yeah, they were great. Them. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yep. Very nice. Very nice. Glad you had a good rest. You know. Uh, Yesterday when you left, Rex, uh, we obviously, all of us that remained on the table, we were tempted to discuss your personality because that's what people do when somebody <laughs> leaves the table. And, you know, it was it was this common feeling that we all had that that you are, um, you know, so, so humble, you know, oh, this, was, this is probably you. the most surprising nice. thing about uh, <laughs> about about you that everybody was saying it's like, God, if I went to space, I will be so full of myself. <laughs> Now, I will and that's why never... we don't get to go to space. <laughs> yes, yes. I will never stop talking about myself and what I did. Well, that's one of the one of the biggest compliments people can give me is when they don't know that I'm an astronaut. Right. And if I don't tell them and they don't find they don't work with me or something, they know me from a different perspective. And then months or years later, they find out I'm an astronaut. And they said they had no idea that it's such a compliment because yeah. I shouldn't wear that on my sleeve. Mm. Yeah. You know, I shouldn't make a big deal about it. It's nice when people know that I'm astronaut and they, and they get excited about yeah. it. But there's times where you, where it's just nice to be a regular, you know, just a non-astronaut mm. and then have people find out about it. And mm. it's so also what? illuminating because it, it helps you realize that people care about you and not your title. Mm. Yes. Because there's, I, I've had the opposite. In, 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 well, there was one time where I was at a, um, at a party for the Super Bowl, you know, the big football game we right. have, obviously. And, uh, There, we were wearing our flight suits at, at Space Center Houston. It's a visitor center for the Johnson Space Center. But the employees also wear similar flight suits. Mm. So this um, this one man was uh, came up to me and he says, "Well, what's going on here t today?" You know, and he did, and and I told him what we were going to be doing. He said, "Well, is, is that all?" You know, he's very dismissive of me, and it, it was just <laughs> very off putting. Mm. And then his wife found out that I was an astronaut, and later on he talked to me completely different. Of course, uh, he, way he treated me, and so it was very, uh, very illustrative to see how yeah. people, how they, how they treat you, changes depending on who they think you are. Which is <laughs> well, sure they so do. that's why it's and, and and we're kind of all that. You have to be honest. We all are kind of that way to a certain extent. But it mm. reminded me how important it is to to see how people treat you when they don't know that you're sure. an astronaut yeah. and yeah. how meaningful. It is when when i find somebody who who just treats me like a king and they have no idea what i do for a living it's it's it's, it's really kind of fun later on to tell mm. them that you're national i give them a patch or something and to have a chance to, to yeah, interact with yeah. them like that i think it's exactly the opposite with geologists to be honest it's like, it's like people surprise <laughs> <laughs> well you, you you know what i'm saying it's like it's like people like like they don't know what you do right and they yeah. have a conversation with you really you're an amazing guy and you're a geologist <laughs> now, how is so this it brings me down a notch yeah, yeah, it's, right. it's like you have to fight your way back up yeah right? exactly <laughs> Was it like Randy from the you know the South Park dad? Wasn't he a geologist? I mean, it's like the, probably the, one of the most famous geologists, actually. Yes, yes, yes. yes. South the, Park the, dad. the image that we have of geologists is exactly the opposite of what we think of astronauts. Yes, yeah. <laughs> which is unfortunate because I met two geologists and yeah. both of them were awesome. Yeah. Well, and unfortunately, I mean, as far as I know, there's only been one geologist who's also been an astronaut. Uh, he was on the last the last Apollo mission to the moon. Oh wow! They, fi okay. it was, they finally got around to sending an actual geologist to look at the rocks um it was jack schmidt yeah. and uh yeah how, how how did that happen so late isn't isn't that a necessity i mean i i, th I thought that on every uh, it, apple mission it you was, had but like they were a... they were the early missions they were really concentrating on flying the vehicle and they mm. were so concerned about getting there and getting back sure. safely they, they 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 entrusted that to test pilots who'd flown vehicles before right. but you know training a test pilot to be a geologist maybe harder than training a geologist to be a test pilot <laughs> I, I, was I, was say, i was gonna say it would be the other way around surely <laughs> but it's, well in some ways it, it's harder but so what they actually did was with, with jack schmidt is they mm. they sent him to pilot training and they actually Actually trained him to be a pilot oh wow mm. so he was a jet pilot and all the apollo astronauts even when they didn't come from the military they were trained to be uh, pilots in the in the t-38 aircraft and so mm. they went to a whole year of pilot training and then trained him and then that way he could be a full-fledged uh, astronaut sure. of that era and yeah. he was a geologist so now he's he's you know <laughs> it's it's so hard to train it like say a, a pilot or an engineer to be a, a geologist and what to look for because you know they treat you they, they give you the, the surface of what it is in geology you need to yeah. pay attention to But your 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 uh, knowledge goes just an inch deep, so mm -hmm. it's really hard to know exactly you know what is what is unique and what is not when you're looking at stuff. Whereas mm. you on the surface of the moon, you could just jump down and look at like okay, yeah, wow, you know, and say then you grab yeah. something like that, like like Jack Schmidt could do. Yeah, you get your eye in, and it's you know once you study geology, I think you just start to see you start to see it everywhere. You can't yeah. go for a walk in the mountains anymore without starting to yeah. unpick how it all mm -hmm. worked and where the interesting bits would be. It's one of the things that I find really frustrating about 
uh, the exploration of Mars at the moment because it takes so long for the rovers to get somewhere, you mm-hmm. know, and you make a choice. You say, oh, that rock over there looks pretty interesting. Let's go check it out. Yeah. One month later, <laughs> <laughs> you finally get out. I just imagine if I was there with a little, with my hammer, I could be there in 15 minutes and check it out. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But, but for, for what I know, and mm-hmm. I don't know much about the moon or, or Mars, isn't it like pretty uniform? I mean, uh, is it really the, the, the way he described <laughs> you're going to go there and you're going to go, oh my God, this is interesting. This, isn't it like only like dust? I, I mean, so uh, the, the surface of Mars is all very dusty and very red. Yeah. But it's really only skin deep. It's a, just a skim of dust on the surface. And oh, right. So you, when you start digging, that's, oh, yeah. that's a different thing. You yeah. even scratch the surface of any of the rocks. Yeah. Um, anywhere that the wind has disturbed sand and moves it around in dunes on the surface, it's, uh, the sand dunes are black usually because yeah. that's the color of the grains of the rock. Yeah. So it is, uh, yeah, and there's huge v- v- uh, variety there. Yeah, still. Yeah. Yeah. Where did the red come from then? Uh, so it's oxidation it's, yeah. of the iron. So uh-huh. uh, iron is in most of the minerals that are around us. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, just the and it's oxidation sounds kind of strange on Mars because it's, it's so dry, right? Um, and there's very little oxygen. But mm-hmm. it's uh, it's other chemicals actually oxidizing it. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting. I mean, uh, going back to the mentality thing you know because i'm really interested in that uh, on that point uh, was the geologist like a nice humble guy as well is that a prerequisite to become an astronaut or is something that the program does to you no it, we do tend to select those types of uh the types of personnel so when we when we we schedule I mean, there was probably this last astronaut selection there was more than i think more than 10,000 people that were up that applied 10,000 people it was really huge and usually it's in, in the four or five thousand and you're cu- cutting that down to you know 10 to 20 people mm. um so it's a huge uh, <clears throat> calling factor and what you're looking so you, you can find the qualified people and then once mm-hmm. you find the qualified people you get them and you and you get to do the medical test which which eliminates a few more but then we have the interviews we bring down to uh, the johnson space center about 120 people and we're picking you know 10 20 people potentially right. And uh, what you're looking for there, they are all, almost all of them are eminently qualified. Mm. Yep. And some of them will let you know. <laughs> and those, uh-huh. those, they're gone in about five minutes. You can, right. come, not, not, maybe not quite that fast, <laughs> but very fast. You can tell that this person is completely consumed by himself. Yeah. Mm. And you, you realize that I don't want to spend time with this person. Yeah. Because what you're looking at, you're looking at that person, would I mind spending <laughs> potentially six months with this person? Mm-hmm. And so you, you look for those kind, of, those kind of traits and stuff. Now, sometimes it's harder to figure out than other times, but you know, that's one of the main things you're looking at is is how well could I get along with this person so you're looking for a track record of that a person being good on teams and and you mm. can look at some of the references and kind of see that also yeah and uh, and the way they interact with each other during the during the week it's it's very illustrative and we are definitely looking for people that are not overly full of themselves which is mm. refreshing to me because I you know I had uh, growing up in the Air Force you know I'd seen the, the the pilots who are just you know the egos that will mm. rival like uh, Tom Cruise body. kind of exactly. personality so Maverick see yeah. those. So when I became a flight test engineer and I was going to be flying with test pilots, I was really a bit concerned. Well, I, you know, it's going to be not much fun flying with these huge egos. Yeah. But the test pilots were a rank above because these were pilots who have most of them had engineering degrees, mm-hmm. and so they were a little more, uh, you know, educated in, uh, and so they were they were a little more. They were much less uh, cocky. They were still had some of that, you know, hey, because they yeah. have to. They're 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 fighter pilots. Their lives depend on them being the best, or they're going to mm. die in combat potentially. Mm. And so you want some of that, but you want them to be, be a, you know, a better, well-rounded person. I think the education t- tends to do that. And so then uh, from the test pilots who I was impressed with, going to the astronauts was even a step above where you just have these people that were generally amazing people that have some of the accomplishments. Like we've had people th- that were, were pilots and doctors, fighter pilots and medical doctors. And we've had, and so it's, it's absolutely amazing that they yeah. can accomplish all this in a short period of time where they're still young enough to apply to be an, to be an astronaut. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, we do, we do look for that. And the other place, you know, and I'm sure you can attest this in academia, there mm. is, uh, you know, so we get a lot of PhDs that, that are not from the military, not flyers and stuff, and they have a, a great skill set to bring. But some of the some of the academia come some of the large egos, too. Yeah, uh, I, oh, bet. I bet. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, a, it's a real problem in academia, actually. It's a real, it's an old boys club. And yeah. people, you know, unfortunately, people hold those top positions and, you know, because <laughs> yeah. they want the fame. They want the, the recognition. Uh-huh. And it's... Yeah, it, and it in a similar way, I think it it, it harms the research, like it harms sure. us as a field, you know. And you don't want to, 
you don't want to work with those people. Yeah, you guys are geologists. You also have to work like uh, like for long periods sometimes, uh, like in teams uh, to some locations, or is or, or, or is it mostly like a sole sole work? Uh, it really depends what kind of work you're doing. Yeah. So, but yeah, a, a lot of the time there's field work involved, and you want right. to, you know. If you're going to be out in the bush for for a few sure. weeks at a time, again, yeah, you want to choose people you're going to get along with. Exactly, you know, it's, it's because the basis of the, the basics of group dynamics, you know, they mm. say okay, okay, like the, that's pop psychology, of course, that I that <laughs> I'm referring to. But uh, you need a funny guy, yeah, and you need a you, you actually need an asshole in, in in every group, you know, who who can like think uh, in in the other way, you know. Uh, is that is that something that 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 is happening in the space program? I mean, do, do you pick a funny guy? That, that we do pick space? funny guys because. Yeah. It's not funny, have, but the people who are hard to get along with, we we try to avoid mm. those. Right. Um, so, it, but I, I I know what you're saying about geology too. The interesting thing is what we get since I get to learn a little bit of geology as an astronaut, mm-hmm. and it's been one of my favorite things. And uh, I had an opportunity uh, several years ago to to go on a geology trip with an eminent geologist from the University of North Carolina to Yosemite and to study mm. some of the uh, the uh, granite and and the, and the how that area was formed. And so I got to be an amateur geologist. So I was mm. reading up on it, and I just was incredibly enjoyed it. And then for about 10 days in Yosemite, I got to be just the, the, the geologist's little helper. You know, oh, so nice. I, it was wonderful. I couldn't <laughs> think of nothing more. It was just amazing. We hiked all over Yosemite, and I yeah. would take notes. We would talk about all these different formations and stuff, and it was absolutely fun. Yeah. So I, I really enjoyed those Well, I bet uh, it, changes, uh, yeah. it changes you because uh, with Zach, we're like, okay, let's go and watch a movie and do drinks. It's like, no, I'm hiking. Yeah. You know? it's like, well, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. But Zach, it's going to rain like hell. It's like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> it's yeah. fine. Take so me where the rocks this are. That's yeah. where I want to be. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Let's uh, let's talk about the the new space age. Um, mm. I I really feel <clears throat> sort of unsettled, you know, about this whole thing that I'm observing right now. And uh, obviously, Rex, I don't want to put you on a spot here because you're <laughs> part right now of a, of a sort of sure. a space 2.0 yeah. company, like very successful. We're going to pay some attention to it during the uh, during the event tomorrow. Um, Axiom, obviously. Uh, but you know, there there are some things that are that are troubling. Uh, at least for you know, from my personal perspective, like mm. f- for some reason, when I when I go back to the first space age, uh, this uh, communal effort, you know, led mostly by the states, by by public money, mm. uh, for for science. For, for science's sake, well, not well, only you know symbolism, yeah, Cold War, yeah. we, we yeah, all know right. that. Yeah. Uh, but right now, it seems like the commercial interests are are on you know top of the agenda, and th- mm. it seems like this is this is driving the effort right now. So whether we're speaking about tourism, which is I I don't see it as being a very significant economically impactful part of uh, of space exploration, mm. but like mining of asteroids and 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 planets and all of that. I mean, what is what is your feel about that? Do you, so what, what is the difference? I think it's a, it's a natural progression. What you right. like to do is you have the government do what governments can only do. Mm-hmm. That's true exploration. Mm-hmm. You send out the pro, the people to the moon, so we're going to find out what's there. We're going to find out all sorts of technology we're going to need from satellites mm-hmm. to communications to to spacesuits to all that stuff. We're going to find all that out when we get you know when we go through this process. And so yeah. you can't send a business and say that say you know early on and say <laughs> hey you know X company go off to the moon and do this and this and just find out what's there and yeah. stuff because there's no profit motive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the true exploration is done by governments and it's always been that way whether it's exploring the northwest in the in the united states we sent uh, lewis and clark out there and they, mm. they explored the they found their way to to oregon there wasn't a business case president jefferson said i want you to go and and, and find a path there he didn't say go there and send up a bunch of supermarkets out there and make some money yeah sure but we found all sorts of things we found plants and animals we hadn't heard of yet mm. and we found a way to the to the northwest coast and then eventually what happened the, the supermarkets and the people migrated mm-hmm. out there and there was a commercial case for it. So with space, it's the same type of thing. The government has paved the way. Now, we've been to low Earth orbit for over 50 years now. We know how to get there. It's still difficult. It's very difficult, but we know how to get there and we're handing things over to the commercial sector now because that frees up the government to do what governments do. So now NASA is going off to explore the moon and go to Mars yeah. And uh, yeah. that frees up the, the you know, companies like us with Axiom Space to, and other companies to, to handle low Earth orbit, whereas mm. SpaceX is now our only way to get to and from the space station in the United States, yeah. followed soon by Boeing. So we've handed over these roles that were traditionally government to the commercial sector to allow them to, to expand there. What we really want to do is we want to have a, a thriving ecosystem in low Earth orbit. We want to sure. have mm. people be able to do research, to be able to do marketing, to be able to do manufacturing of materials you can't do. Mm-hmm. And so 
so I'm happy about that because it, we're, the, com, the commercials are not really replacing government. It's filling, it's backfilling for where they've moved mm-hmm. on. Yep. And so eventually there'll be there'll be commercial companies that that go to the moon and and do the mining or the asteroids and stuff like that. But you need the, uh, that true exploration first. So sure. I see it as a progression. Mm. Yeah. I think I think I'm getting the best taste in my mouth because of the personalities who are driving that. But let's not go uh-huh. let's not go there. It's uh, <laughs> but but I'm 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 with you that it makes historical sense. Yeah. You know, like like totally. But is there a business case really? I mean, you as a geologist, when we are speaking about okay, we're going to mine asteroids. Sure. Is that, is that viable like business opportunity? At all? <laughs> to some extent, yes. But I think it's. You know, we have to manage our expectations about how worthwhile that's going to be to bring mm. something back to Earth. Because it costs so much to get out there in the first place. Mm. And then it's going to cost a huge amount to bring stuff back as well, yeah. whatever material you're collecting. So, you know, they do these calculations. They say, oh, there's a, you know, the the minerals that we make cell phone batteries out of or yeah. uh, cell phone magnets out of. There's two tons of it in that asteroid we could get. Yeah. And it's worth five trillion dollars <laughs> but the economy doesn't work like that yeah. even like right. what we don't need that much of it either so i think there's a real the economics of it don't work yet yeah. uh i think for the most part the use we're going to have for minerals uh, and materials we mine in space is in situ in situ resource utilization right it's to so that you don't have to bring things up from Earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can actually build things in orbit or on the moon with the materials you find there. I think there's not a lot of scope for bringing things back to the Earth. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it makes much more sense to uh, to actually focus on efforts on, on taking things from Mars and making it, you know... Making it usable there. Make, and right, yeah. make it usable there. And right. that's a really extreme case, because then, I mean, if you're trying to bring something back from Mars, mm-hmm. you've got to pay to get your all your equipment out there. And then launch it off of the surface of mars yeah. and all the way back to earth it's uh and uh, i i think simply there's probably nothing that's actually worth that much right on the surface right. of mars so where was the commercial interest then so you know the other thing you can do but <clears throat> the, one of the aspects besides mining things is just start mm. simple you want to start by finding water mm. and once you find water you can make rocket fuel you know you can make you can make the oxygen which is oxidizer for your rocket fuel mm. and stuff so and liquid hydrogen liquid oxygen is what's you know fuel the space shuttle's uh, main engines so if you can start something relatively simple find water like on the moon and the, the southern, you know, southern poles of the moon mm-hmm. and stuff, and, and and do those kinds of things where just you know saving gallons of water uh, instead of bringing them from the earth sure. is yeah. hugely, hugely afford, uh, economical. Yeah. And so those types of things you got to start first. Yeah, and uh, so okay, if, if we deny this opportunity, let's say it's too early, it's way too expensive, it doesn't make any economic sense to mine uh, to mine things. Where is then the commercial interest? I mean, you were speaking about low Earth orbit. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But so we can talk a little bit about, about you know, you talked about space tourism. And, you know, yeah. you've seen, obviously, Virgin, Gal- Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin fly people into space. Suborbital is a lot different than orbital. You know, suborbital means you're going just up into space mm. and you're coming right back down. This is Virgin, right? This is Virgin or, yeah. or Blue Origin. They're just mm. – because. It's a fairground there, ride. There, yeah. exactly, <laughs> to a certain extent, that's true. So, because what you're doing is you know, you're going to Mach three and you, to go up to get into space, and then you're coming back down to go orbital. You really have to get that orbital velocity, which is Mach 25, 25 times the speed of sound. So it's an order of magnitude bigger problem. Mm. So it's much more expensive and it's much more difficult. But once you get to orbit, you can stay there. Yeah. Now, so so you say, what is the, the function of of space tourism, of suborbital? Well, mm. it is it is a nice way of getting people to just experience for a few minutes what space is like. But what it really should hopefully transform into is point-to-point transportation mm. here on Earth. So right. if you, instead of going straight up and straight down, if you can shoot it a little farther and then come back down over, you know, from from New York and come back down over London, now you've been able, you, know, you can you can fly over the Atlantic in you know 20 minutes potentially. Mm. Oh wow! And so if we can have point-to-point uh, transportation, which people want to do, and, you know, mm. and SpaceX, would, I'm sure, would like to do that with Starship, and I'm, I think Virgin Galactic would like to do that someday. But if, yes. if somebody cracks that nut, it will transform, you know, commercial spa- human human uh, airline traffic and, and, and mm. open up a new, whole new case to be able to get from point to point on Earth in, in a matter of minutes as opposed to hours and hours. So oh, that's wow. a logical, you know, growth of that, which could come. So it starts out with, yeah, for some very, from wealthy people being able to get just a, you know, mm. yeah. a, a touch of space, and that's all they get. Um, to maybe that can morph in later on to point to point travel. Wow, I never, I, I've never yeah. seen it like that. You know, from from this perspective, the, it's a, yeah, it's a really interesting idea. The point to point. Is yeah. it? Do you know, like, in terms of fuel efficiency, is it how if, if ignoring the cost of a right. rocket and everything, right. but a fuel efficiently efficiency if you compared it to an airplane it wouldn't. It probably wouldn't get as. I, I'm not really an expert at that, but sure. that could be a bit a bit of a. It, 
it, it could be difficult. So it's not, mm. but but you, your first per- point is right. It's got to be reusable. You got to mm. make almost everything reusable. The the yeah. the, the booster and the, the upper stage, which right now we don't. We get the boosters that are reusable. The upper stages mm. we're not getting reusable. So if we can get all those reusable, then we can bring the cost down. And then you're basically because I think I've heard you know it's just a fraction. The, the fuel is just a fraction of the cost. Right. The problem is is the, is not having reusable rockets. You know, mm. and Elon Musk makes the the point. You've probably heard it before that you know you can imagine how how expensive it, it is to use re un, to be Used expendable rockets. It's kind of like, well, you can imagine how much it would cost to fly across the United States or across the ocean from New York to London if every time you got there you threw away the airplane. Yeah, you know, so it's so you got to get all that reusability down, and then you know you're looking at your liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, or whatever mm-hmm. your propellants are to uh, yeah. uh, to get you to space or to get you to the point point travel. Yeah. Oh wow. Well, hopefully we'll get there. That's that's yeah. that's that's, yeah. that's really interesting. And even space tourism, you know, it gets it gets some bad uh, PR, so mm. to say. It's yeah. like, oh, look at those rich people going right. going up there. And th- there was argument to be made that yeah, it's exactly influential people that you want to you know go and see and experience what astronauts are you know often saying about their own personal experience for coming from space. You know, right. like what they what they what they learn from the experience. So can you elaborate on that? I mean, what, yeah, that's, how can that's that one change? of the most interesting things was. Um, you know, I, I have my doubts about space tourism too. You know, when you have these, you know, rich folks that go up there and, mm. and, yeah. you know, they come back and some of them don't have that humility. <laughs> they have more of the arrogance, like, you know, mm. and they, you know, I'm an I astronaut, you know, kind of like, yeah. oh, wait a minute, you, you, you know, you, you flew in space f- for a short period of time for a few minutes, but yeah. it was suborbital and, you know, it, it's nothing you trained for and you didn't have anything mm-hmm. to do except just ride on the rocket. Yeah. But it can be changing by having that overview effect they call when you see the earth mm. from above. And the one thing that really turned me around was, uh, was, uh, William Shatner, Captain Kirk. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't know if you saw him fly, but you know he's nine years old, and he came back, and he was so eloquent. He was. Mm. She could. They interviewed him right there. He was talking to uh, Jeff Bezos, and he was just saying how incredible it was to to pop out of the Earth's atmosphere, and this, and it was almost like being surrounded by death. He said that the the, mm. the 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 you know the the blackness of space, yeah. but the way he talked about how transformative that experience was right after it happened was like I'm like. Wow, and he put into words some stuff I had thought of, and I could, I could, <laughs> I could, uh, I could um, identify with some of the things he said. But having more and more people that can that can mm-hmm. that can talk about things like that and talk about the fragility of the earth and, yeah. and things like that, I think it helps. <clears throat> yeah, and also to train as a crew, there's something to be said for the way that training for a space flight together with a crew uh, it really helps bond you and helps you helps you figure out how to get things done together. I mean, we get along real well in space with our international partners, everybody from the Europeans to the Russians to everybody. Yeah. We all work together as one team because we're this little outpost in space. We're the only 10, 15 people, however many people mm. are there of humanity that have ventured <laughs> off the earth and are off the earth at that particular time. Yeah. And so you have a vested interest. You're all in it together. And so you work together, you solve problems together, and uh, and you figure out how to make it work. Yeah. Mm. I feel like it's a great idea to send all the presidents uh, yeah. Like, like, yeah. Up, up in space. Like, uh, have a look at that. Yeah. Really marble. And yep. look what you're doing to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And but, I think that the, one of the interesting things, I think, with space tourism is, yes, it's only the, the billionaires and millionaires now, but they're really volunteering themselves as guinea pigs for right. something that will have a much broader yeah. right. societal use later. Because yeah. I think it's, you know, hopefully we're going to get to the point with space tourism or just buying a ticket that, you know, universities or governments will be able to just pay a private company to send their scientists up yeah. with, with a particular experiment to do or, you yeah. know, or when we get to the, the moon, that's a little bit further off. But to it's you know, like have telescope a university right now. It's program like having, that, yeah. OK, we've we've got some investment. We're going to send our own mission to yeah. to the moon with a private company. And that's yeah. what we're trying to do with, with Axiom Space, with my mm. companies. You know, we're, we're, we have the infrastructure to send people to the International Space Station. So we take people that want to go for whatever their reasons are. You know, they could, and we flew our first flight, AX1, in April, and we flew three, uh, three uh, paying customers to the space station with our company astronaut, Mike Lopez Alegria. Now, those three people could have done anything they wanted. They could have done sp- just tourism. They could have mm, just yep. stayed and looked out the window, and they could have just done anything they want to, you know, done branding or outreach. To their credit, they wanted to make their their missions meaningful. They mm. spent a lot of money for those missions, and they wanted to, to do research and 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 into the human body and, and science, basic wow, good science. For them. And so we they had a whole portfolio of research mm. that they were doing on the space station that they that we helped them find, and they and they found amongst themselves. And so it worked out great. I mean, it was an amazing chance for these three individuals to to really you know help push the the uh, the, the uh, frontier of space flight along mm. and so ha- having that capability now into these private astronaut missions with axiom space is that now we can grab let's say a, com- a country does not have a does not have an astronaut corps does not have a space program but they want to have a space program mm-hmm. we can 
basically say, okay, you know, we can help you find an astronaut or you can tell us who you want to fly and, and we will help them with their research portfolio and we'll, we'll train them, we'll get them ready to fly and we'll fly them in space and they can have their whole, their, do their whole, all their research in space they want to and come back and, and you've got basically this little self-contained space yeah. program and you don't have to buy the infrastructure. That's commercialization mm. at its next phase for space flight. So we can do that with private wealthy individuals who just want to go there and, and have their own program or we can do it for nations with, we call them professional astronauts who are, 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 have been trained by their country and they're trained by us to, to go to the International Space Station. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I mean, we are way overdue. It's been like 40 yeah. years since we've flown <laughs> astronauts, so now we can just mm. like delegate right. that to you. It'd be great. It's, you it's, bet. It's awesome, yeah. yeah. Mm. It's an awesome opportunity. Because it's a lot of infrastructure to build, and it's, it's, mm. see, you see that expensive. a lot. You see that a lot today in the space program is, is companies try to take a, a niche market and say, okay, it's hard to do this part of it, so like people who do ground stations, you know, they mm. say, uh, they say, okay, we, you know, we'll do the ground station for you, so you don't have to worry about your mission control or, or whatever, and yeah. we'll do this part for you. So, the more you can commercialize it, they can make it efficient, and then you don't have to worry about that stuff. Mm. And so, the more you can you can compartmentalize all that those things and provide a package. Say, hey, just provide us the person and their and the project they want to mm -hmm. do. We yeah. can, we, you can you don't have to start building up a whole space program. You don't have to have your your little version of NASA in your country. You can start small, build it up from from some people that have flown, mm -hmm. and uh, and get a chance to do that. Yeah, sounds great. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Yeah. Well, although you know, sometimes the, you know there is a there is an argument that it's it's the road that it's important. You know, as you said, you know, you have you mm -hmm. have these like millionaires yeah. who go there, but they don't go through the right fifteen mm -hmm. years that you went through. Uh, you know, so there is that. Uh, but but still, you know, it's, it does sound really beneficial. And when you, and especially when we're, when we're speaking about this this change of mind that that actually occurs, I think this is something that science does to you in general. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, in your field, like. Uh, I, I can imagine, you know, the humility. I also I often ask myself about like uh, astrophysicists who are looking in space, you know, and seeing the scale of it all and mm. how small they'll feel and uh, and all of these cliches. But examining the Earth, does that have the same effect for you? I mean, it's like yeah. billions of years, you know, things. I, and that's the thing. We call it deep time. Yeah. This, this concept of just incredible depth of time that yeah. really is difficult. It's impossible to really comprehend. Wrap your mind around yeah, it. Yeah, it's... Uh, but it's but when you start studying geology you have to start to unpick it a little bit and you start to separate it into these broad epochs of yeah. time and then but each i don't know i feel i feel like it's learning you know human history yeah. you 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 learn about major events and then one thing leads to another and it all kind of fits together and you can yeah. do that this the really exciting thing is you can do it for any planet or moon and each of them has its own really long history yeah but i think it's it's difficult. I, I I think I fool myself sometimes into thinking that I understand what four and a half billion years on this planet <laughs> <Yeah>. means <laughs> because I know a bunch of things that happened in that time. But if you start to multiply it in your head, it's like, oh, I've got a pretty good idea what a hundred years is. A thousand years, I think I can get that. Okay, <sighs> 10,000, 100,000, yeah, uh -huh. million years. It, it, it becomes meaningless yeah. in a way. Um, and I think the the biggest, greatest evidence of that of is of how deep that time is yeah. is evolution. Just to see how much something can change over those generations, how much a life form can change, and yeah. that to me that's like that's what gives the greatest sense of that time. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, what is your what is your feeling then? You, you you're going to give a talk on on the Ratio Forum tomorrow about the possibilities of like exploring Mars, mapping mm -hmm. Mars, and etc. and the possibilities of it have uh, uh, having had life at some at yes. some point. So, what are the odds? I mean, what do you what do you uh, think? You know, we I've, it's <laughs> we have one data point for mm -hmm. for life on Earth. Awesome. No, yeah. or for life in the universe, and it's us on Earth. Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult to make any solid predictions about whether we'll find it or not. What we do know about Mars is that we're pretty certain now that it had the conditions for life about three to four billion years ago. But we don't know exactly how long those conditions lasted. Mm -hmm. And we definitely know that after uh, ever since 3 billion years ago, it's not been a very good place for life. Yeah. So if you look at the evolution of life on Earth, it's something that's promising about finding life elsewhere in the universe is that life on Earth appeared, <laughs> in a geologist's terms, almost immediately after there was water and yeah. oceans on the Earth. Uh, but then it takes... And, the, and that's just like simple bacteria. But yeah. then it takes another 2 billion years to get to a cell that has organelles and a nucleus. Like, mm -hmm. you know. And then it's a couple, it's a 
billion years after that before we get multicellular life. So even if there was life on Mars, we think it probably wouldn't have uh, evolved beyond that early yeah. bacterial life. Very simple. Yeah. So it makes it really difficult to look, look for, obviously. I can, can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's... Uh... Even if we find a small bacteria, that should shake us to the core. It should. Mm. But, the, of course, there was this process of normalization. You know, people will find Jesus in that as well. You know, there <laughs> be, like, plenty of things are going to happen, and people are going to look at it from, from different ways. But, um, you know, definitely, you know, space exploration and, and, and the possibility of life of other planets can be, like, shattering for, uh, for us and... Yeah, and I, and I, and I'm just wondering, you know, in in the microcosm that you that you inhabit, for instance, you go to the space station, you have like a bunch of people, a bunch of people there. Uh, uh, this idea that we have that once we become a space species, we're going to be united. You know, it's like it's going to be like the Earth Federation. You know? <laughs> but but usually the uh, the sci-fi authors are speculating. Some of them, at least, you know, oh. others are actually transporting the same human condition and putting it like thousands of years ahead, so nothing changes. But how does that change in, in this micro world that you that you, that you inhabit? Do well, I think there will be a, a sort of unity amongst the people that do make the journey to Mars. You know, if right. we ever mm. become a multiplanetary species, when you have uh, you know hundreds or thousands of people on Mars, I think there will be a certain unity. It may there may be a critical mass when you get bigger than that, they start fracturing potentially. Mm. Yeah, but I think in the beginning there'll be a definite crew mentality that hey we are in this together and mm -hmm. we all have to uh, pay attention to things mm. and we, we have to you know put the, the the good of the of the group amongst uh, higher than the individuals and so uh i think it'll it'll start out that way hopefully it'll stay that way i don't know if it'll help people back on earth because it's it doesn't help them necessarily now because yeah. they, they they can see that we're traveling in space. They can see the pictures we brought back. They can see how the you know the um, glaciers are melting and and all different aspects of climate change and how the Earth is changing. It doesn't affect them as much mm. as you'd like it to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a really good point. I think it's mm. like it, I wonder about because you say it should shake us to our core if we find life yeah. elsewhere, but it's but I don't know if people will <laughs> if recognize will. Yeah. the significance. It's, uh, it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. that and also that we are probably going to remain <laughs> tribal, as you said. You know, Mars people are going to go like, like I don't know. You know, the, uh, it, it sounds it sounds probably a little bit esoteric, but uh, do you think that the selection process that you that you guys went through in order to work well together, you know, to do your work well, and now by looking at this opening of space for random people like myself, yeah. honestly, at some point. Do you think that if we uh, just imagine uh, some sort of a human migration, that this should be something that we should consider? It's like, okay, so we're moving to mm. Mars. Do we need to think of what are the kind of people that we actually yes. want to go mm. there? And or even not? NASA does. And we've mm. made a point of that. We've said, okay, now how do we need to change things for selecting astronauts that may you know, stay mm. in space for more than a year or go yeah. to Mars someday? And the answer is yes, you do need. You still need the people who have the, the basic self-care skills and the concern for others and stuff. But now you don't necessarily need the the person who is is great is greatest in a team environment, whereas they they can't be by themselves for very long. You need mm -hmm. to start picking people with traits that that they can they can handle being a, by themselves alone for a long time, because on a journey to Mars it may take a year to get there. You know, to a year on the surface and a year back. You're talking you know three year mission, yeah. and there are times where. You will be by yourself. There'll be there'll come a time as you're departing from Earth where you get so far from Earth that that voice communication is almost mm. useless. You're gonna have to go to a one-way type of uh, like a texting or one-way burst transmissions because yeah. it's gonna take maybe it's even five even a, even two minutes. Let's say you say, "Hey, uh, Bob, how you doing?" You know, yeah. two minutes later, he hears that. Two minutes later, oh, I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, two minutes that's later, great. great conversation. Yeah. So the conversations, you won't be having a normal conversation not too long after you leave Earth. So mm. you, you, that voice communications, you know, you'll still be able to do like blast transmissions, you know, just get kind of like monologues or podcasts mm. for that matter. Mm. Um, but uh, you're going to do a lot of texting, I imagine, and just wait for it to come back and things like that. But you're going to be spending a lot more time uh, alone. Yeah. Mm. And the thing is, as you get farther and farther from Earth, you know, the well, nice thing about the space station is you're 250 miles from Earth, so there's a beautiful globe, go, you know, underneath mm -hmm. you the whole time. It's just gorgeous. You never get tired of watching it. That's home. You can see your every place you've ever been on Earth, or most of the places you can see them. Yeah. Now, you get a few weeks away from Earth on your, you do your trans-Mars in insertion on that three-year three, three year mission, and it's going to be not before long before the Earth becomes just a dot. Mm -hmm. And everything you've ever known is in that dot. 
and it'll change people say and i agree with them it'll change the meaning of the word loneliness when mm. all your entire experience is back at that dot and you don't know for sure you're going to get back there or not so you have to have a, a different mindset so i think we will pick people who can handle that mm. that takes some true explorers the, the type of explorers who could cross the ocean back in the old days we you know it, it seems like for me it'd be almost too much i don't think i mm. I, I would mm. be really it wouldn't be great for me to go on a mission like that but there are explorers out there who who are more well suited to that mm. who can handle those types of extended ways at times away from home where three years is a long time and if you're going to be you know like say you're going to you're going to be out of that radio contact before long and that for a, a big part of that you're going to be incommunicado except for just you know texts and emails and stuff like that and and some voice calls and stuff that uh, that podcast so it's going to be different so yes i do think you have to select people who mm. can handle that kind mm. of inherent uh, uh inherent loneliness potentially mm. as you as you go and you're surrounded by a field of stars And that's all there is. That's your entire universe. There are probably not many people that can handle that. I, I no, imagine a combination not. of like yeah. a Buddhist are. monk and a scientist. Right. Like, but, yeah. but the, the, the encouraging thing is there are, and there have been in the past. And I, and I taught myself, yeah, <laughs> could you imagine leaving England when you were, you know, a, a, you know, a young person and traveling to the new world back in the old days, and you knew you're never coming back. Yeah. Everything mm. you knew was gone, and all you were around is ocean all around you. And then, you know, a couple months later, you're... Or however many weeks later, you're but you're in the new world and everything's brand new. So mm. those are the kind of explorers, and a lot of people did it. They had vested interest to do it because they, you know, that things were so bad back home potentially. But there are people that want to do it for the adventure too. Mm. Yeah. Well, how do you find this this company? Isn't it uh, you know counter to the point that you know we you need people like you, you know, calm and you know collected and everything and at the same time it has to he has to be sort of a maverick type of person yeah you know it's like that's 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 the difficulty i think you know yeah. it, it needs to be But bold you and just have to you just have to you know there's it's different a personalities a, mm. factors you have to yeah. tone down and, and and ramp up and there are people who who are lo who can get along who like being alone maybe they're introverted more yeah. they like being alone but they're still good team players sure. mm, yeah. so you kind of it's a little bit harder to find you have to find this this spectrum of people but then you start looking for people who okay this person wintered in antarctica they know what it's like to to good spend start. six yeah. months down there and they, and they well how do they do so you, uh, now you got to go find out the people who work with them well how do they do were they a jerk or were they mm, uh yeah. were they were they fun to be along with and so And we, fortunately, we can be picky. We can, yeah. you know, if, when we're when we're talking to folks who who know folks we're considering, you know, we we're asking all all the people we can find that, you know, that hey, what were they like, you know, yeah. and and if you find well, they if you get a qualified answer, it's probably not your person. If you get this sure. is one of the people you need. When you hear that, that's mm. what you usually the unqualified. Hey, this is just the person you need to talk to. You need, you need to see. I thought yeah. the process was more elaborate, <laughs> but it's uh, but it makes sense, of course. But yeah. it is; it's a long process to get sure. to that point, and we can't do that for everybody. Because you mm. don't always know somebody who knows somebody. But uh, of course, when yeah. you can, the best the, the best information you get is from people who know them mm -hmm. and are unbiased. Maybe not too close to them because they may they may shade it a yeah. little bit. So um, people that they list as references aren't always the best references because yeah. they're. Mm. But some of them are. You can get you can just get a hint of it. You know that, that hey. Sure. So it's it's interesting. It's an interesting process. So 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 the the Armageddon scenario in which we have like a bunch of crazy geologists and then guys <laughs> yeah. working in the oil industry and all of them are different. All of them are assholes in their yeah, own yeah. way. You know that's probably not happening. Well, it depends. You know, if if, they, if that's the need, you need those geologists, the, yeah. you, need those, you need those miners, and they're the ones who are going to save the earth. You know, yeah. that, you may, that may be what you have to select for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But 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 again, it's surprising that. They don't have geologists on board when they. Well, what am I talking about? It's like not not we're not visiting planets every week. This or, saddest but, thing for me. I would yeah, love I mean, to go somewhere, but we need. I need some of the surface to stand right, on if yeah. I was ever gonna be of be of use with my profession. And, and we do pick geologists now, so we've had mm. geologists in the space program. So astronauts who are geologists, besides Harrison Smith, he was the first one. Yeah, he was in the lunar, you know, the Apollo mm -hmm. program. But yeah, we pick them now, and we know that's a valid skill set that we like to have. So in the pipeline potential, I don't know how far it goes of of landing crews that yeah. go on Mars or on or. On the mm. moon. There are geologists there. Who well, we are... haven't decided who's going to do that, but right. we have. We do have. I don't know if there's a currently a geologist in the astronaut corps, but there may yeah. be. But uh, you know, that's one of the. That's one of the more skill sets we'll be more predominantly wanting right. to pick. Mm. So we may in the next astronaut class, they may say, okay, we want three or four geologists. Yeah, and by looking at your field. Are you needed there? I mean, can't you just send a probe to dig something <laughs> and analyze it? I mean, are you are you being replaced by robots now, Zach? Yeah, well, no, it's a good point. I mean, I I don't know that I would be necessarily a great geologist on Mars. Yeah, I don't do a lot of field geology. I really enjoy it, but that's not what my specialty is. Right. My my specialty is remote remote sensing. So it is looking at the surface of a planet from orbit and trying right. to figure out what it was like on the surface. So 
That's my specialty. I think it's odd that this is something that you can actually do just by observing and then like, yeah. figuring out what's going on. And yeah, so I mean the rover the rovers on Mars are great, but they're very limited in where where they where they go on the planet right. for a variety of engineering reasons. There's only limited places where it's kind of safe to send them. Yeah, uh, and also they can only travel. They generally only drive a few yeah. kilometers or tens of kilometers, and you've got the whole rest of the planet. So. Most of what we know about Mars really comes from the orbital uh, orbital imagery and uh, orbital yeah, scans that we have. Not from things on the ground. It, uh, don't get me wrong. It, it is very important. But it's uh, without the context of the whole planet, sure. uh, it doesn't mean as much to, mm. to see, to get exactly the composition of the rock where, yeah. uh, where a rover is. Yeah. And it's going to be nice to have a, like a bipedal, like, human being who can like explore whatever <laughs> whatever he wants you know I, and that's yeah i saw a good trial of uh, an interesting uh rover they were trialing for the moon yeah. um or just in a sand sand lot but it's uh it didn't walk because bipedal is very difficult to do as sure. engineering wise it was kind of a a four-wheeled frame with the torso of a <laughs> of a, a human torso yeah. that, <laughs> to be used to manipulate things and yeah. uh it looked it looked really good actually it looked like the best uh the best of both worlds. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's because when we think of human exploration, it's very tempting to think that the human part of it, you mm. know, the participation of people in the space mission is, it's like it's very symbolic. It's for romantic reasons. It's <laughs> like, uh, you know, because there are people, uh, there are voices out there who are saying, it's like, let's be practical. Let's just work with robots and machines. You know, mm. they don't die. They don't have families. They don't say, like, wh- do you see that? like happening at some point i mean no the, i don't think so because i think people always want that well the, the the useful value of a human is just the ability, the ability to think mm. beyond what you're programmed to do like zach was saying about you know the the ro- rover they say okay i want to go see that rock so you know a week later they drive mm. over to see that rock you know with a human you're going to do that in in, a, in, in, in seconds you're going to mm-hmm. walk over there you're going to look and then you're going to see something what's that you know the robot can't right. say what's that yeah. you know because you get somebody like zach and a planetary geologist that, that's used to doing field work you know mm. that they're going to know exactly what to look for and, and it's going to take seconds for them to say well that's mm-hmm. and they're going to find that the robot may never have found and then there is the you have to you can't just count the inspirational factor of people want to mm. know people have been there you know you could send a robot to the top of mount everest who'd care yeah, you know, people people want to f- see what's what is it like to climb it, to be there. <laughs> what is it like to to travel to Mars? You know, and the, the, the expression people say is that people never named a, uh, an elementary school after a robot. You yeah. Know? <laughs> so it's the people that have done things that they want mm. that they want to do that, and they want to feel that a person's been there. Yeah. And you know, the same thing is inspired me. But I, I'll never get a chance to go to the moon, most likely. But. I want to see some of my colleagues go to the moon. Mm. I want to hear what it's like. Well, what was it like? You know, how how was it? You know, and how did everything go? And watch them to land and, and take off again and see that whole program uh, uh, take place is something that I really want to do because it's, it's, it's inspiring to see humans do yeah. something. Yeah, definitely. It yeah. makes it into a real place yeah. as well. I mean, you can see I, the, the rovers do it to some extent. You can see uh, you can see the landscape right. to, to scale, you mm-hmm. know, but to see a person standing there, you know, it's. I don't know. I, I can I can much more easily put myself in that place and understand that it's sure. yeah. it's not just a an orb in the sky, a circle. It's it's not abstract. It's real. You can touch it, and it's yeah, and yeah, the yeah, whole again, universe is like that. It's interesting when you say that because my ten year old actually told me that it's like when I, when I told him that there were people who landed on the moon at some point, mm. and he 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 didn't say it in the in the same way, but he said that it doesn't feel foreign. Now, yeah, you yeah. know, it's like it's it's just, now it's in the neighborhood. You know, it's like we, 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 we've <laughs> yeah. been there. So it's a it's a it's an interesting point. Yeah, I think there's a, there's also some practical advantages of sending people. Not only the the initiative that yeah. a human will bring to exploring, but I mean, look at the Apollo missions and how many samples they brought back. Sure, mm-hmm. just the fact that you're bringing people means that you're going to bring them back. Hopefully, yeah, yeah, and it means that you're probably going to have some spare weight and some spare room to uh, to take things with you. And the the Apollo samples, you know, people still scientists still request to use those, and great science is still being done as we 
as we uh, improve our analytical yeah. processes. 50 years later. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We even saved some cores and asked to save some cores that they do not open for 50 years. Yeah. And we just recently opened them. Mm. That was because, you know, you don't want, you keep them pristine so <laughs> that, you, but you don't know what kind of, you know, analysis equipment you have this mm. year, this, these days oh, you wow, don't you have 50 years ago. That? Yeah. So they mm. did. You probably know more about it than me, but they, 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 they yeah, they preserved some samples they just yeah. opened not too long ago. Yeah, and it's a it's a great idea. I mean, that's it uh, is. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Trust trust in future generations that you know this is going to be worth. They'll know better what to do with this. Than, is, than so, is there know. another one that is going to be open in a hundred years or I something? Don't that think so. I, I, not, I don't know. But not I think that was, I not that I know yeah. of. But, yeah. Yeah. but hopefully, we'll go get some more before that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah let's, so let's just hopefully. go back. <laughs> well, it depends on the work that you guys are doing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> essentially. So, uh, thank you for this conversation. Uh, best of luck uh, uh, to you, Rex, and and your endeavors with uh, with Axiom. I mean, what you what you said about the potential of uh, of companies like 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 Axiom to give us all like universal access to space someday. I think it's uh, it's 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 really great and hopefully you will you will pick this guy with you because obviously we need a <laughs> like a geologist in space yep. there yep. all right so thank you very much guys cool. thank you thank you